Welcome to the new Silk Road History Podcast. In part one, we saw how Emperor Yangle became emperor and inaugurated the series of voyages to countries overseas to establish diplomatic relations and to engage in what was known as tribute trade. To that end, he ordered the construction of a massive fleet of several hundred vessels, including the so-called treasure ships, which were almost certainly larger than any ship ever before constructed. At the head of the fleet he placed Emerald Tseng, who had been his year-long companion. In the autumn of 1405, the fleet with 317 ships set sail on the first of its seven voyages. Here, in part two, we will follow these seven voyages, not in detail, but to capture some of the legend that has adhered to them. Follow us on Facebook or Twitter for more interesting content, or take a look at our website where you can find more podcasts, books, and an online library dedicated to the new Silk Road. The first voyage sailed down the coast of China, collecting provisions en route. The first foreign port of call was in Champa, what is now North Vietnam. The visit provided the Chinese with ebony and other red woods, including aloe, from which they made incense. The fleet then proceeded to the Indian islands of Sumatra, now known as Samaranga, which was then the main entrepot port in the Southeast Asia Bengal region. However, they deliberately avoided the city of Palambang that had fallen into the hands of a notorious pirate called Yong Su Chi. From Indonesia, the fleet sailed to Sri Lanka, but received a very frosty reception from the king and departed empty-handed in the direction of Kuri, which is now known as Calcutta. This had always been the fleet's main destination, and it stayed there for four months. On the return journey, Zhang Por decided to resolve the privacy problem in Palambang by attacking the pirates, destroying their fleet of 17 ships and annihilating the force of 5,000 troops. The fleet returned to China in the autumn of 1407 with envoys and tribute from five city-states. A few months later, the fleet set sail once more, but with only 68 ships recorded, and it's possible that only the major ships were actually now counted and the supply ships were just assumed to be there. And the quick turnaround can best be explained by the need to capture the prevailing winds. The voyage followed much the same pattern as the first, except that the fleet detached itself from the rest to visit Siam in order to establish relations there and trade in the many hardwoods and spices, as well as tin, that the country offered. After a short stop in Sri Lanka to make donations at some Buddhist shrines, the voyage ended again in Kuri, where the Chinese were able to attend the inauguration of its new ruler. The Chinese built a pavilion in the city and placed there a tablet with an inscription. Though the journey from this country to the Middle Kingdom is more than 100,000 li, that's about 6,000 kilometers, the people are very similar, happy and prosperous, with identical customs. We have here engraved a stone, a perpetual declaration for 10,000 ages. The fleet returned to China in the autumn of 1409 and departed almost immediately, this time with only 48 ships, or of course, possibly a few more. The third voyage also had Kuri as its final destination and it made the usual stops on the way. However, on the return journey, Chang Ho stopped off in Sri Lanka, and it was now payback time. King Alagonakara had not only been respectful on the first voyage, but had tolerated piracy in the regions and had intended then to attack the Chinese fleet, but it had left on time. On this occasion, the king sent 50,000 troops to board and seize the Chinese fleet. But with the main Sri Lankan force heading for a confrontation with the fleet, Chang Ho had surmised that the capital would be left only lightly defended, and he dispatched a force of 2,000 men to capture the city. His forces succeeded not only in capturing the city, but also the royal family, and in defeating the main army when it came to rescue their king. The royal family were taken back as prisoners to Beijing, sorry, to China, where the fleet arrived in July 1411. The king was pardoned, but only on condition 
that he surrendered his throne. The fourth voyage was the first to sail to Muslim lands, set sail with 63 ships or more in the autumn of 1413. The fleet followed the usual itinerary until it reached Kuri, where again there was considerable trade to do. Mahuen, an interpreter with the fleet, was impressed with the smart, fine and distinguished appearance of the citizens and the honesty and incorruptibility of its officials. From Kuri, the fleet sailed west for 25 days before reaching Hormuz. The Chinese were well received and the king sent a delegation back to the Ming court with many expensive products, including several famous Arab horses and a giraffe. On the return journey, the fleet stopped off in North Sumatra, where a civil war had broken out. And when the usurper attempted to attack the Chinese fleet, his army was defeated, the pretender was captured, taken back to China, and later executed. In December 1416, Ambassadors from 18 countries paid tribute to the Emperor of the Middle Kingdom with a huge exchange of gifts, including, strangely enough, a second giraffe that had been brought by the emissary from Malindi, a city-state on the coast of Kenya. The fifth voyage started in the autumn of 1417 and, having reached Humus, travelled to the mouth of the Red Sea that controlled the trade route to Egypt and down the African coast to Malindi. In total, envoys from 16 countries made the return journey to pay their respects. By now, a veritable zoo had been assembled for the return journey. Lions, leopards, camels, ostriches, zebras, rhinoceroses, antelopes, other exotic animals, and, yeah, you guessed, still more giraffes. The sixth journey, a smaller one, with 41 ships, covered much the same range of countries. The main fleet, however, focused on Malacca, Kuri and Hormuz, with separate uh, squadrons were dispatched to other destinations. And it arrived back in 1422 to a rather changed political situation. While the fleet had been away, Emperor Yonglu had decided to suspend any further voyages since the Chinese troops were engaged in fighting the Mongols in the north. In 1424, the emperor died, but his successor confirmed the injunction. The fleet remained at anchor in Nanjing, serving as the city's garrison. But then, in 1430, the emperor ordered it to undertake one more journey. 1431, the fleet set sail, arriving in Kuri in December and in almost the following month. This was probably the most western end of that voyage with the remaining ambassadors returning to their homes on Arab vessels. In July 1433, the fleet was home once more. It was to have been its final voyage. So why did it all come to an end? Well, the main reason for suspending such voyages was one of cost. During his reign, Yonglu had two other pet projects. The first was to restore the national prosperity by rebuilding the 1700 kilometer long Grand Canal and redirecting it to include Beijing. This way it was able to improve the grain shipment throughout the country. The second of these projects was to move the country's capital from Nanjing to Beijing and to start work on the construction of the Forbidden City and the complexes and fortifications surrounding it. When you add the military campaigns against the Mongols to this mix, it's easy to see why the treasure ships were seen as a bit of a luxury. But the explanation goes deeper than this. The emperor did not merely suppress the treasure ships. He ordered the destruction of all ocean-going vessels. He forbade the building of any vessel with more than two masts. And he outlawed all private trade on the pain of death. Now, one of the reasons for this was a battle for control over the imperial court. When Yonglu consolidated his grip on power, he effectively decimated the Confucian administration that had traditionally ruled over the country and relied much more instead on eunuch advisers, much like Admiral Chang Ho. The new emperor restored this Confucian preeminence in the administration, and Confucianism 
with its emphasis on land and family and on social stability and hierarchy, had little time for the disruption caused by private capital and private enrichment. So what remained of all of this? Well, at one level, not really very much. Zhang Ho may be a rational national hero today, but he faded from popular memory until 1904 when a new biography over him was published. He was then rediscovered as a symbol for a greater China and adopted by a more assertively nationalist Chinese movement that was emerging at the time. However, his immediately legacy did survive. The demand for Chinese products and the establishment of trading links to fulfill it sucked in new producers and traders to replace the void left by the Chinese retreat from the seas. The circulation of Chinese coin and notes helped to monetize the economies of Southeast Asia. And the sailors and passengers who had left the voyages at various points on the journey helped to reinforce a Chinese trading diaspora. He may have been forgotten at home, but temples dedicated to him can still be found today in places as far apart as North Vietnam and Malacca. Well, again, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Music was composed by Janet Zaddo, and details on how to reach us will be on the following slide. I hope that we'll meet again in some of the rest of our videos. Goodbye.